don't even listen to that. When I heard somebody playing the music, I said, what is that? And the child said, two chains. I said, really? Is there a five and a ten chain involved? And he looked at me like I was mad. I just want to be serious with you. Ludacris, listen at that. You fight. Back in the day, you followed the OJs. Back in the day, you listened to the music, huh? Of the Temptations, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. You listen to good music. Michael Jackson, when he was in his right mind looking like us before he bleached himself out, you did not listen to people called ludicrous. What does that mean? Don't you know ludicrous mean crazy? <laughs> My goodness. Come on. Y'all hey, got, got to hear what I'm saying. You keep mimicking these heathens. You have, if you watched an Alice Cooper concert, you would have turned it off and ran to the high heels because they were killing chickens and eating and biting off the heads of them back in the 70s. You hey, would have hey. gone to a Kiss concert because, you know, that's night in the, what, unification of Satan's council? Hey. Huh? You wouldn't have gone to that. But you listen to Jay-Z. Huh? You listen to Beyonce Bounce. Oh, yeah, I got to talk to you now, Israel. Come on. You listen to everybody who keeps telling you that they're out in the world. Who would name their child Blue Ivy if you understand what Ivy does and what Blue really means? Okay. Uh -huh. Huh? Right. Come on. You ain't right. hearing me. You put the word for the Illuminati. You proudly, you proudly boast the Illuminati. Dang. Which tells me that it's been watered down and weakened since you know about it. Because in the day when you talk about it, you couldn't talk about the Illuminati out of fear trying to tell you what time you in. You're talking about secret societies and orders that if they were so secret, you wouldn't be talking about. Now you hear what I'm saying, beloved? Hallelujah. How secret could it be if you know about it? Because you're the last person to know about anything. If you want to hide something from Israel, put it in the book. But you know about the secret societies. Eagle lifted up his feathers. Yeah, the eagle are written, man, if you don't get out of my head today, you're kind of ill. So you're in the second book of Ezra. In the 11th chapter, 12th chapter, when the eagle's heads are worn with his head, he's going to lift it up his feathers so you can see. Because before it falls, the three heads go into confrontation with one another. Well, that's called Obama. Well, that's called Trump. And well, that's called Hillary Clinton. Now do you understand where we at in prophecy? Cain, hallelujah. All right? He said, what is this brother talking about? You need to go read the book of Second Ezra and the image and the prophecy about the eagle vision. And the eagle vision is revealed as being Rome in the latter days. And the eagle's heads are beginning to squabble with one another. Oh, my goodness, somebody here with right now. You have to understand where you are. And your focal point is you're, you're more concerned with who is going to become the president than you getting home. Come on. You don't worry about, yes, it's time to go, Lyle, or Laya, you're absolutely correct. It's time to go home. You worried about, don't you be like Lot's wife as we move through this next part of the scripture. She worried about whatever she was leaving in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what the scripture refers to when she turned around. She looked back, not just on her past, but what she was leaving behind. The materialism. The gain, the wealth, you turn around and look behind, you worried about what you're leaving, you leave that car here. You have to leave that materialism here. You may have to leave that man or husband or wife or child or children here. Yes, that may happen. That may happen. If you love here in your past more than you love your hope and your future, it all depends on where your love is. Who do you love? Who do, do you love your people enough? Do you love your family enough to save them and not try to use our apathy for not doing nothing and put it on Yah? You know that little story used about the man who it started to rain as we get ready to go into the book of Micah. It started to rain, and the street flooded. And a man with a paddle boat showed up and knocked on the door. And the brother came to the door. said, yes, can I help you? 
He said, yeah, I'm here to take you away. It's flooding. He said, oh, no, God going to save me. And the brother in the paddle boat went away. Y'all going to save me. Huh. And then the water kept coming, and it raised higher that it was right beyond the door to the bottom of the first floor window. And then here come another ship, and it blows a little air horn, and the brother opens the window, and the brother tosses him a life preserver. He said, no, no, I don't need that. Y'all going to save me. And the boat went away. Finally, the water had risen so high, forced him out of his house. He was on the edge of his chimney. And here come an ocean liner now because the water is that deep that it will support the weight of an ocean liner. If you understand the flood story I'm giving you. And it blew a massive air horn. And the brother turned around and looked. And the captain blew from a bullhorn and said, come and get into the lifeboat. And they dropped the lifeboat and he waved his hand off and said, no, no, I'm waiting. Y'all going to save me. And the water continued to rain. And eventually, it overflowed the house, and the man drowned. Hallelujah. All right? The man drowned. You keep on waiting. Keep on waiting when he keep giving you the vehicle to get out of here. Keep waiting, Israel. So when the man finally got unto Hashemayim, and it was recorded, and he said, man, yeah, I waited on you. I waited through the paddle boat. I waited through the first ship. I waited through the ocean liner, and, and, and you didn't deliver me. And he said to him, who do you think sent the paddle boat, the regular boat, and the ocean liner for you? Hmm? So keep on. He's sending people to you. He's sending a way for you to get out. It's very simple. You have to take the steps to make a way for you to leave the land of your captivity. What's saying that dumb shit? Because he said right. come- Period. And it's just that simple. You can believe what you want to. You can get up and go to the stove, but you want to get up and take care of your own self. You can believe whatever you want. I'm going to bear a record to you. People will do that only to suffice whatever it is their belief system is. If what I'm saying is not true, then there was no need for Noah and the ark. This is not going to save me. Yah did save Noah by an ark. And Noah warned people for 120 years. And people laughed and mocked. He laughed and mocked till the rain came. And the laughter was over. So you keep on stalling, Israel. Keep on playing. Because when the mark of the beast is fully active here, where you can't buy, where you can't sell, without that chip, without that RDF, keep on. Because they have set it up to where it's going to be active at the end of 2017 going into 2018. Then we're going to see who was telling the truth. Me, with all the scripture and the stuff that we studied for 30 years, or those who just came into this yesterday talking about their Christian belief system. You think you're going to be caught up, head and pie in the sky, and fly up into the clouds in a rapture. There ain't no scriptorial proof nowhere about no rapture. Are you being cast up in some clouds, taken away, floating away? You don't find it nowhere. But keep on. And I'm not mocking the scripture. I'm just mocking the foolishness in Israel with their mythology that they bring with them from Christianity or their mythology that they bring with them from Islam. Yeah, in Islam, Muhammad rides into the clouds on a white steed. If that don't sound like a bunch of Greek mythology to me, I don't know what it is. Hmm. You got to come up out of these ways of the Gentiles and the heathens and their belief system. Creator is very clear in his word. Your restoration is back to Israel. It's to the promised land. Micah chapter 4, 1 through 3. And it reads on this wise. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many goyim, many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the El of Yaakov. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion, HaTorah shall go forth, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. 
He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong Goyim afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and they shall and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and mm. under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of Yahweh Sabaoth has spoken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's in the kingdom age. And so you see that war will be no more. For that is the reference to they shall beat their swords into plowshares, an instrument of farming, an instrument of harvesting, and their spears into pruning hooks, an instrument that deals with the vegetation and with growth in Israel. It's not about war anymore. It's about peace. But the law shall come forth out of Zion and the word of Yah from Jerusalem and no place else on earth shall that be so. And so unless you done dipped off into the gods of the heathens and the gods of the places where you so dwell and live amongst, then you would have that simple understanding and oneness. And then I don't mean simple as in something degrading or low. I mean simple as it's very easy to see that the law goes forth out of Zion, right? Out of a place in Israel, Mount Zion, right? Har Zion, the mountain of righteousness. And the word of Yah from Yerushalayim, Yah's city of peace, or Yah's city that teaches peace. That's the place that Israel, as a nation of people, should have their focus on. If you're going to some destination, then destination is home. Destination is Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. So when we say, well, why don't you say pray towards the east? And we say pray towards Jerusalem, and you are praying towards the direction of the city where Yah put his name. You've read all these scriptures that confirm that, then we give you prophetic scriptures. Uh, and so we're going to simplify this also, Daniel chapter 6 and 10. On this wise... Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before Yah, and as was his custom since the early days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so we see that Daniel... When he was praying, he opened his windows towards Jerusalem. So now if he was in Babylon. So if we get a map and we physically look where he was at in Babylon, Babylon, Babylon is east of Jerusalem. So that means that when he prayed, he simply turned towards the direction where Jerusalem is. That's what all the saints do. So whether you're in Canada, you face Jerusalem, right? Whether you're in France. You face Jerusalem. Whether you are in Saudi Arabia, you face Jerusalem. Whether you are in Afghanistan, I'm going the furthest portions east for Israelites. There are Israelites that we know that are in Australia. You don't tell them to face the east because east to them would be the eastern peninsula of, of Australia. You tell them to face Jerusalem. And if they turn and look what would be the direction of the west, Jerusalem would be closer to them from the west in its positioning than it would be if they were looking at an eastern designator. Your focal point is not on the cardinal points north, south, east, and west because you're scattered to the four cardinal points north, south, east, and west. Your focal point, Israel, is the center of the earth, the navel of the earth. It is Jerusalem. Why do we call it Jerusalem the center of the earth? Because the heathen knew that. The heathen knows that. Hallelujah. If you understand that every nation after Babylon that came and destroyed Jerusalem tried to get back in there because they understood that it was ground zero central, ground zero central, that every nation that came up right into that region that emerged as a world power wanted Jerusalem. The Greeks wanted it. Babylonians wanted it, or rather the Babylonians wanted it, the Persians wanted it, the Greeks wanted it, 
Pompeii and Rome came in 68, 63 B.C. They got it. Herod and his offspring of the Adumia of the Edomite lineage wanted it. Look now, to show you, everybody else wanted it except you. Romans came in 70 A.D. They wanted it. Hmm. Egyptians came after them after they'd fallen. They wanted it. Then it fell into the hands of the crusade through the 11th, or the 10th and the 11th century. They wanted it. Saladin came with the Muslims. They wanted it. Hmm. Fell back into the hands of the Egyptians. I'm just giving you the bullet-pointed version without the historical years and etc. Just want you to follow the premise of what I'm trying to get you to understand. They wanted it. British had it under mandate. They wanted it. Before the British had it, the Ottoman had it. Everybody had it, wanted it, but us, who are the actual real landowners and the inheritors of it. Boy, if you don't sound, we don't look like Esau, despising our birthright. I don't know what we is. Hmm. That is the jewel of Yah. That is the center, yes. And now from a political standpoint, because I just gave you the spiritual, you got to want this because it's spiritually right. It sets you back at the spiritual epicenter of the world. That's why you want it. It's Yah's high place. And then from a political standpoint of governance, in economics, that was the old ancient land connection to Asia, Asia Minor, and Africa. It was an old trade route, and people who are military or people who were in the military know that we were taught that whomever controls Jerusalem controls the world. Now let's see if we correct on that. If you look in the area of finance, who resides in Jerusalem and controls the finances of the world? Come on. Hazard. The Hazards. Yeah. Come on. It's not New Year. Yeah. They, they, Zuriah who hit it. Sarah hit it. The Khazars. They understand that. He who controls Jerusalem controls the world. You got Palestinians. They call themselves Palestinians, which in fact they are the descendants of the Rabbah, Arabs fighting over land that don't indigenously belong to them. And you've got Khazars, who are not the people of the book. Hmm? you got Edomites, who are not the people of the book. you got the descendants of Japheth through his sons of the German descent, Ashkenaz, who are not the people of the book. And they are all fighting over land that belongs to you because they understand the value of that land. That land, just in mineral wealth alone, is rich. Okay? Wealthy. Wealthy, wealthy, wealthy is that land. And here we are, the only people on the earth that don't have no land. <laughs> Y'all see how that matches up? Are people that don't have no land need land. Now, people that don't have a flag needs a flag. That's a part of nationhood. Right? Land, wealth, all that comes out of land. Land, land, land. We get our food, our clothing, our shelter, our ability to produce our own natural resources out of the land. And it looked like they're giants in the land. Zuriahu knows exactly what I mean. Kajia knows what I mean. We are afraid, some of us, because we see the offsprings of Anak there and the Nephilim. And we appear to be grasshoppers in their sight. But we have a mighty one who is championing our cause. And the scripture says that you can pray unto him for whatever reason. That's what the book says. And if you pray unto him, and you keep his commandments, it says that he will maintain your cause. And if your cause is not righteousness, then he's not going to maintain that. But if your cause is the restoration of you as a people back to the promised land, and that's a part of his plan, for I, you don't know the thoughts that I think of you. I'm in Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah 29. Thoughts to do you good and not evil. A thoughts for you to have a hope and a future. 
Jeremiah 31, 17 says for this, hope in your future for your children shall return to the promised land. Take us into the next prophetic scriptures, Yekaziel. We're going into Psalms 55, 16 and 17. Why did Daniel pray three times a day? It says it was custom, right? So Daniel is living in the 5th century, and the Psalms that we're taking this from is written in the 10th century, 500 years before him. Let's see what Psalms 55, 17 says that Israelites are to do. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many against me. Yah will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from old, because they do not change. Therefore, they do not fear Yah. And let them, and let them know that Yah rules in Yaakov to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 16 says, and as for me, as for me, this is David writing this. David lived in the 10th century, 500 years before Daniel wrote what you read in Daniel 6 and 10. So Dadi said, as for me, I will call upon Yahweh, and Yahweh will save me. Evening, the beginning of a regular day, morning, and at noon, three times a day, three times a day, Israelites are to interact prayer, make supplication to the Most High, three times a day, evening, morning, and noon. I will pray and cry aloud, and the book says, he shall hear my voice. Zechariah 2 and 12. Zechariah 2 and 12. We're almost finished. Just a few, a few more minutes. Just kind of bear with me. And it reads on this wise, and Yahweh will take possession of Yahweh, duh, as his inheritance in the Kodesh Aretz, in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's another prophecy that at the appointed time, he will choose Jerusalem. Zechariah, Zechariah 8, chapter, verse 1 through 8. Let's go through some more prophecy as we get ready to go into the Besorah, because the focal point is Jerusalem, the high place, the central sanctuary of Yah's high place, as we get towards the scripture for the new Jerusalem. 8 and 1 through 8, Aki. Cain, and it reads on this wise, And the word of Yahweh Sabaoth came, saying, Thus says Yahweh Sabaoth, I am zealous for Zion with great zeal, with great fervor I am zealous for her. Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the Ooh. city of Ha'imet. Hmm. The mountain of Yahweh Sabaoth, the holy mountain. Thus says Yahweh Sabaoth, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand. Because of a great age, the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Thus says Yahweh Sabaoth, if it is. If it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of his people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says, Yah says Yahweh Sabaoth. Thus says Yahweh Sabaoth, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back, and they, will sh and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people. And I will be their L in truth and in righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, again, Zechariah, whose name means to remember Yah, right? The remembrance of Yah. Yahweh will restore Israel in the kingdom age. The restoration of Israel is what you just read. Right before the kingdom age period. And it's real clear that this is applicable to where the elderly will be in the streets. And they will assemble themselves in Jerusalem. You know, Zakanim, right? You know, Zakan, the masculine, and Zakanah, the feminine. You know, the aged will be there. The children will be there. You know, it will be our possession because the Holy One of Israel himself will dwell in our midst. And this one shall be peace, right? This one 
shall be peace. As we go into the books of the Besorah, and we're focusing still on Jerusalem. You know, one of the very first places that Yerushalayim is mentioned is in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. So we're going to just touch on some key points of Yerushalayim, and then we'll look at a much more of a heavier uh, expose of what the scripture uh, reveals in Matthew 23, 37. Uh, we'll look at Luke 21, and then we'll close back in Revelation 21. So we have about another 10 minutes, maybe 15. Y'all all right? Thanks. Hallelujah. Thanks. All right. So I can take another 15, 20 minutes, say? Thanks. Hey. Okay. Okay. So let's go to Cain. Okay. So let's go to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. So we're looking at one of the first places that Yerushalayim is mentioned in the Besora. <laughs> Bakasha. Okay. Okay, and it reads on this wise. Now after Yahawashai was born in Bethlehem of Yahawadah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Yerushalayim. Hmm. Hallelujah. In verse 2 and 3. So we're focusing that came to Jerusalem from the east, right? And we know from the history books and studying that this is the Magi or the people from the east who were astronomers that understood the positioning of the stars that a king would be born in Israel based upon the positioning of the astrological celestial body. This was the same thing that happened in the days of Abraham. Same thing happened in the days of Moshe, or Masha, called Moses. Same thing happened again in the days of Hamashiach. There was a positioning of the celestial bodies. 2017, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the same star system or celestial positioning reappears. 2017. Hmm. 20, Go ahead. Read on. 2022, huh. 20, 20, two, Cain. Okay, uh, chapter 2, verse 2 and verse 3. Okay. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born Melech of the Yahawadim? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Hallelujah. And in verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Hallelujah. <laughs> And so Herod knew he wasn't the rightful heir. That's why any king would be troubled, that there would be an heir born in Yerushalayim or born in Bethlehem of Yehawadah, and everybody that was in Jerusalem was troubled. Uh-oh. It's just like Pharaoh was troubled. <laughs> Pharaoh was troubled because his rulership was coming to an end. Masha, yes, Masha brought his government, Yah used him to bring it to an end. Nimrod was troubled when Abraham was born. Him and Terah had things going on with idolatry. Okay. Huh? You better read the books of Jubilee so you understand why Abraham had to get up out of that town, out of that country, and from his people. He destroyed the idol shops in Nimrod's own city. What city? The cities of Babel, Iraq, Akkad, and County in the land of Shinar, which is the Hebrew word for Shumer, meaning Samaria. Abraham got up and he destroyed them because he found the trueness in the one and living, y'all. He was a threat to Nimrod's system. Moses was a threat to Nimrod's system. Yahawashai was a threat to Herod, threat to Rome. You, the king that is coming, is a threat to the system of the beast. You are a threat, Israel. Don't you know? You are a threat. When you awake, you are a threat. When you sleep, oh, you like a cat or a lion that somebody gave some catnip to. You just purr and roll over and fall back to sleep. But now in the great awakening, you awake, you are a threat. And the king that is coming is a threat to the system of the anti-Messiah and the anti-Yah-like government. You're a threat. Jerusalem is mentioned here. It's a high place. Look at Matthew, hallelujah, Matthew 21 and 10. 
Let's draw another little point of reference about Jerusalem. What else was happening in Jerusalem, 21 and 10? Okay, and it reads on this wise, And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Who is this? Verse 11, So the multitude said, This is Yahawasha, Ha-Nabi, Le Nazareth, Le Galilee, or Le Gala. Hmm. So they identified him as a prophet. Hmm. Look at that. From the city of Nazareth, which was a ghetto-like city in Israel, because can anything good come out of Nazareth? Up in the Galilee, which is, yes, which is in the northern providence. And the city was moved. Jerusalem was moved by what the man was teaching, by what he was saying. He was stirring the people up. He was bringing them back to the law of Moses, back to the Torah. He wasn't taking them away from the Most High. He was bringing them back to the Most High. And he was doing most of his teaching out of the place where the enemy had taken and made Jerusalem his high place. He was an adversary to Herod. He was an adversary to Rome. This man was a threat. Some of us got this depiction of Yahweh Shai wrong. We've got the religious spin on it. No, we got to give the historical spin to this. This man was a threat to Rome. He was the king of Israel. He wasn't no spiritual or religious threat. He was a political threat to them. He was a political threat to Herod. He was a political threat to the Adumim. He was a political threat to the Edomites. Because Yahweh was going to set up, was sent to set up the kingdom of Yah in Israel again. When you go to the books of Kings, and next week we'll touch on this when we do the lesson about the kingdom of the Most High. You will find in the books of Samuel, you find in the books of Kings, that Yahweh set up the kingdom of Yah. That's the exact words. In Israel. That's where the kingdom was set up at. Yahweh was coming to do what? Restore the kingdom. Acts in the first chapter, verse 6 says, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So you ought to have the kingdom restored back to you. This time we got a righteous king sitting on the throne. His name is Yahweh Shai, Hamashiach, Ben Yahweh, the son Hallelujah. of that's who the king in Israel is, the true king in Israel that will sit up on the throne of David, his father. Back to Jerusalem being the focal point. 2337, and then Matthew 24, 1 through 3. Matthew 23, verse 37. You're still dealing with Jerusalem. Oh, oh Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophet and stones those who are sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as hens gathered her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house has left you desolate. Hallelujah. So now, Yahweh laments over Yerushalayim. We have a history, a plethora, to where Yah sent up his prophets to us, rising up early and sending them. He did not just send them out to the outskirts. But he sent them to the kings, and the kings resided in Jerusalem. The warnings came first to the kings, because the kings are the head. And we must understand and know that as we learned here, so go the king, so go who? Say again? People. The people. So go the king, so go the people. Well, the kings were evil. This man did wickedness in Yah's sight, and the prophet would go to that king and warn him and then warn the people. The king in Israel is the figurehead. And so when the king would hear the word of the prophet, or when you would read places in the book of Kings, and it says, and King Yoash, the son of so-and-so and such-and-such, -and -such, or you would read the king of Hezekiah, he did good in the sight of Yah, and he established his king. So that's the pattern. So when Mashiach comes, he does not come to placate the Edomites, the Adumi. He doesn't come to placate the Sanhedrin. He comes to expose the filthiness in their garments, spiritually and politically. The man was a threat to them. And Israel would not hear. Jerusalem would not hear. So when he talks about 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you're not just talking about the city. You know, that city that is the physical land is not what he's talking about here. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets. The city of Jerusalem didn't kill the prophets. The people of Israel that is metaphorically called Jerusalem, we killed the prophets. We are the very people who murdered the prophets of Yah. Our ancestors did that. They were sent to her to warn her. And the Mashiach says, how much have I wanted to gather you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks? That's for protection. But you were not willing. You were not willing to be protected. The house is left unto you desolate. And again, you shall not see my face henceforth. So you say, blessed is he who cometh in the name of Yahweh. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And that expression is uttered at the second advent. The second advent. But you shall not see that face henceforth again until we say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of Yahweh. Not blessed if he come in the name of Jesus. That will even line up. Because the Son himself is named after the Father. He said himself, I come in my Father's name. Blessed is he that comes in the name of Yah. Not blessed is he that come in the name of a false God. Not blessed is he that come in the name of a false leader. But he that cometh in the name of Yahweh shall be the blessing upon that one in Israel. And Yahweh shall have paid the price. He laid down his life. For Israel. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of Yah. That warning was to Jerusalem. Because that prophecy there prefigured the destruction that was coming that we're going to read about in Luke chapter 21. When he gave his greatest dissertation, right? He did it in a certain place. He didn't go up to Nazareth to do it. He didn't do it in the Galilee. He didn't descend down to Demona or Arad or down in Eli. He did his greatest dissertation. Again, the center point, the focal point is Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. We're just going to see where he did his work at. 24, 1, 2, and 3. And it reads on this wise, Then Jehoshaphat went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples, Talmudim, came up and to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jehoshaphat said to them, Do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall be not thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the Talmudim came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So then his dissertation, which some Bibles call it the Overlet Discord, and that is a Latinized phrase that is translated into English. The dissertation takes place on Har Zetim. Write that down. Har, H-A-R, mountain, hyphen, Zetim, the mountain of olives. It takes place on Har Zion, or rather Har Zetim, the mountain of olives, on the east side of Jerusalem. Now, this is the... Jerusalem that is up in the northern portion of our land in the territory, still in Yehawadite territory, and not the southern Jerusalem that is down in the south near Arad. You say, well, why are you bringing it up? Because I want to make a distinction for you. So when we travel up, you can see the two different places. Because this one is the one that had the temple in it where the scripture says that not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And for those of us who understand that prophecy, meaning that there would be no remnants of the temple building remaining erected. That came to pass in A.D. 70. Titus and Vespasian came in, ransacked Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple and raised it to the ground. Is that what it says? Obadiah says, raise it, raise it, raise it to the ground. That's what it says? So the temple that is spoken about here is raised to the ground and destroyed. You go to Israel, you go past the western wall, which is not the temple, was just the part of the wall, not the temple. Ain't no temple there now. You go to the south, down by Arad, and you see a temple. And inside the temple is a high place. And that high place has Yah's name in it, and it has the pagan god Astaroth in it also. Two different places. Huh. Brought that out to you for a reason. 
so you don't be deceived. So you don't be deceived, because there's people telling you, come to the high place that's down in the south, but that high place, the temple walls of that high place are still intact. In fact, there are two pillars outside that temple. Hmm. Where in Jerusalem, there is no remnants of the temple. In fact, what they rebuilt upon it is a pagan shrine right at the Dome of the Rock. Now, Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah is there, the same place that Abraham sacrificed or was going to sacrifice Yitzhak. Oh, this is pertinent here. My goodness. Major, major importance here to Israel. The focal point is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Luke 19. We're in the book of Luke. We got four more, five more scriptures, saints, and we're closing. And we're actually right on time. Hallelujah. Luke 19, 28. Luke 19, 28. It reads on this wise. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So, the triumph entry of him into Jerusalem. The triumph entry. Watch now. The triumph entry. Now, that means all the kings of Israel except for Saul, and except for David at the beginning, until David takes the stronghold, which is Zion, everybody after Dawid, when they become king, they are inaugurated in Jerusalem. So let's read this so we can prove this. When he had said this, he went ahead on going up to Jerusalem, Aliyah, and it came to pass when he had drew near Bethphage and Bethany, at the mountain, which is called Olives, Hazekin, he went and sent for two of his Talmudim, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where you enter, you will find a coat tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. <clears throat> and if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say unto him, Because the Adonai, or ha Adonai, the Lord, has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the coat, the owner of it said, Why are you loosing the coat? And they said unto him, Ha Adonai has need of it. Then they brought him unto Yahawashai and threw their own clothes on the coat, and they set Yahawashai on the coat. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. That's what we did. And then as he was now drawing near the descent, now look what he's doing now, of Hazatim. He's coming down the mountain of Olives. The whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise Yah with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of Yahweh. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called out to him from the crowd, More, Rabbi, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And as he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, now listen to what he said about our city. If you had known even you, O Jerusalem, especially in this day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when the enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. That was prophesied. Did that happen? Yes, it did. King. And at every level, you and your children within you to the ground. They will level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you in one, one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Mm. Did not even know the king was among us. Didn't even know that Yah had sent his own very word. And that word became living flesh. I'm talking about we had the word in our midst. You can actually 
You think it's something to put your hands on the Torah or the Tanakh? What it would have been like putting your hands on Hamashiach in praise or touching Hamashiach? Like the woman who had the issuance and she touched the hem of his garment and she was healed because that was the word of Yah made flesh. Did not understand the time of our own visitation. So then events had to unfold upon us. And again, Jerusalem is the center point. Luke 21, 20 through 24, Yekaziel. He's on this wise. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Yahawada flee to the mountains, to those to let flee to the mountains, let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and in and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive to all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jerusalem, that is the focal point, right? Because there's two of them. The one that's the focal point is the one that's trampled down by the Gentiles to the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So now let's go ahead and define that. Because Jerusalem in the south, Hmm. The one that is in the south is not trampled down by the Gentiles. It lays desolate. It says nobody visits her. Look at that. Lays desolate, nobody visits her. Okay. But now Israelites are coming to it, and Israelites should go to it and visit it because it's a part of our historical past. But it does not fit the prophetic utterance of Hamashiach right here in the book of Luke. Why? Because he says, Yerushalayim, shall be trodden down by the Gentiles to the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And the Gentiles are walking in Jerusalem, the city of where he was crucified in on Golgotha to this very day. Why, in fact, the prophecy is fulfilled in that Jerusalem is divided into four quarters. Have one quarter of it belongs to the Armenians, one quarter belongs to the Christians. The other quarter, which is the East Jerusalem, belongs to the Palestinians. And the other quarter belongs to the fake Khazarian so-called Jews. All of them are Gentiles. Not a one of them are Hebrew. Trodden down by the Gentiles to the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's prophecy. That is fulfilled right now today in your in my, in our very hearing, Jerusalem, wrath upon this people. Let's see if that was true, because he was a prophet. Moses said, Yah will raise up unto you a prophet like unto me. His words you shall hear. That prophet called Yahawashai, the word of Yah, said, wrath upon this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. Did the Romans kill us by the edge of the sword? Yes. Did they murder 1.2 million of us? Our bodies were flowing into Galilee? Yes. Did they come upon us at the mountain called Masada in the caves? Yes. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. Next part of the scripture. Led away captive into all nations. Did the transatlantic slave trade? Lead us away from the land of Israel and the west coast of Africa into all of the lands of the captivity? Yes. Then Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles to the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You are in that time right now and it is coming to a close. The times of the Gentiles and their close are upon us. When the Messiah made his last physical appearance among Israel, it was in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 9 through verse 12. Because you'll read that. We're still dealing with Jerusalem. Acts 12, verse 9 through 12. No, no. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through verse 12, sir. King. King. 
Verse 9 through 12, Acts chapter 1, and it reads on this wise. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And hmm. while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Yahshua, who was taken up from you into heaven, will soon come in a like manner as you saw him go into Hashemayim. Hallelujah. And in verse 12 says? 12. Then, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. So approximately, oh, a quarter of a mile walk from the top of this mountain down, Mount of Olives, Har Zetim, where Yahushai was translated up into the heavens, right? And then he is to return in like manner. So you go into the prophecies that are in the Tanakh, especially in the 14th chapter of the book of Zechariah, it says that his foot shall stand upon the mountain of Olives, and the mountain shall cleave in the middle. And it will cause a great earthquake when the split occurs, and then a large valley will be produced through the generation, meaning the generating of energy force, by the earthquake and the implosion that occurs. And so the same personage that we're talking about that went up is the same personage that comes down. He does not return to Israel in America. He returns to Israel from the place that he ascended from Israel, in Israel, in Jerusalem, on the mountain of Olives. So we want to get that out to every. We want you to see that. He... He's like, how can I say this? Abba, in the way he does things, he is consistent. I am Yahweh Eloheka. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, be not be consumed. If he's going to deal with us, he always deals with us on a national level on his high holy days. If he said something for you to see, and you see Hamashiach translated up, and you see the second coming and his return, it tells you in the book. It's going to be right there in Jerusalem, right there on Mount Olives. And the prophecy that fulfills that is Zechariah chapter 14. I believe it's verse 1 where it is. I might be mistaken, but you can look. It's in the 14th chapter. That's out of Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 12. So on the other side of Jerusalem is this other mountain. And this other mountain that we'll talk about, as we close, two more places and we're finished. It's Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. In the book of Revelation 14, verse 1, and in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, and it reads on this wise, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the Lamb of Yah that take away the sins of the world will ascend on Mount Zion. And with this Lamb, it says 144,000, having his name, some of the manuscripts there, and his father's name written on their forehead. Okay. These are the same personages. Now, wait a minute. Now, we started this lesson back around 1230, and we were talking about that the gates of the city had 12 names on them. And the 12 names on the gates of the city was Ruben, Shimon, Levi, Yehawadah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Yiskaskar, Zebulun, Yosef, and Benjamin. There's no Gentile names that are on the gates of the kingdom of Yah. None. These 144,000 are not Gentiles. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 says this, I heard the number of those that were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Yisrael are sealed. And it goes in enumerating you, we as a people, tribally speaking, from 
Yahawadah, all the way down to the tribe of Benjamin. Twelve tribes enumerated. And where do the tribes go up? We read earlier, they go up to Mount Zion. Where do the 144,000 go? They go where? Up to Mount Zion. So preparation should be towards Jerusalem, should be towards Israel, Jerusalem, and Mount Zion. Wedding supper of the Lamb takes place where? In Jerusalem. The kingdom comes down where? In Jerusalem. So everything's happening in Israel. Ain't nothing really happening on earth that's really important if you're a real Israelite. Your focus point is going to be in Israel. If you're a real Israelite, you're going to be in Israel. You ain't going to make no excuses why you want to stay in hell when the actual term of your sentences is almost up. <laughs> you're going to be headed home. That's what, If you're a man and woman of Scripture, really, and you lay the hard what's in this word, Yah is pointing you in the direction that he chooses for you to go. That's what I'm saying. That's all I'm saying to you, beloved. I'm saying to you, huh? I need dodi le dodi li. <laughs> my beloved is mine. You are my beloved and my beloved is mine. You belong to Yah. He's point I belong to him. He's pointing me in a direction. I'm just letting you know. I'm telling you what I'm going home. Yah willing. That's the direction. I pray you want to go home. That's the direction. Kadiel you know, closes out Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, all the way to verse 14. Let's read what the scripture says about the kingdom age. Revelation 21, 1 through 14, and it reads on this wise. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, although there was no more alt sleeker. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, Yochanan, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of Shemaim from Yah, prepared as a bride adorned for her, her husband. And I heard a loud voice from Shemaim saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they, will, and they shall be his people. Yah himself will be with them and be their El, and Yah will wipe away every tear from their eye. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for those words, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the foundation, Shlika, I will give of the fountain of the water, the fountain of Mayim, of life, freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his El, and he shall be my Ben, my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The one of then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me. And talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Rega, 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 one change. second. So now we see the new Yerushalayim, the Hebrew word there, El Chadasa, renewed, renewed. And Yerushalayim comes down from heaven, from Yah, onto earth. Now we go up to it. It comes down to us. Behold, the tabernacle of Yah is among Men, Yah dwells with us on earth, not we go up to heaven to dwell right. with him. you got some folk been teaching this wrong. We teach this right. We're going to make sure you understand it, that the kingdom come down, not you go up. Huh? You come down. You're going to be translated at a certain period of time 
because of the judgment that falls upon earth. But when the new heaven and the new earth is reinstituted and established, then you will dwell in the kingdom that is on the earth and not off in space somewhere. Now, you read all of this. We want to make this clear. Cowardly and fearful ones, unbelievers, abominable ones, or those who practice abomination, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, witchcraft, pharmacon users, that's drug users, yes, I said it just like that, and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. That's the second death. If you go into the books of Corinthians in the first chapter, or first book around the sixth chapter, it says that these things will not inherit the kingdom of Yah. So you're not going to find no homosexuality in the kingdom. Mm. You're not, yeah, you ain't going to find no immoral. You ain't going to find no adulterers in the kingdom. You're Dang. not going to find no liars in the kingdom. You're not going to find no drug users in the kingdom. You know that would be just like the world? That would be just like the world. Ain't no distinction, no difference in Yah's kingdom if you let that, he allows that to happen in his kingdom. You might as well be in the world. If you don't want to live in a place that's righteous, that's good, that's upstanding, that your children can play happily in the streets of Jerusalem and not walk and worry about a drive-by or a walk-up shooting. Don't you want that for your children? Other than you got to keep them behind barbed wire? Because that's how you live in America. That's how you live in the captivities. You live under fear and constant threat of something dangerous happening. That's why you worry about your loved ones, because you don't live no place safe, no place peaceful. And most of the world is like that right now to this day, because the world is living in the days that the Scripture says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. We are living in a lawless type of social order, globally speaking, and not just talking about here in this particular land of the captivity. I'm talking about everywhere. This is anti against the creator, what we have going on here. That's why these, these works and people who do those works, they're burnt up in fire. There's a purification, not just a cleansing with water, but like you in Noah's time, oh, no. I bear record, and I wasn't around at the days of Noah, but I bear record that the wickedness that's happening on earth right now is a hundredfold more worse than what was going on in Noah's day. Okay. You got more people. You got billions and billions of people who are just completely out of order and alignment with the creator. So he would have to come, and the thing that purifies sin is fire, where well, water simply cleanses it. So there would be a judgment that is coming. I stopped the Kaziel at, at a particular point here because I want you to focus on that it says that come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. The bride, the lamb's wife. Aki, could you read verse 10 through 14 as we close? So this is the lamb's wife that you're getting ready to read about. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, mm -hmm. descending out of Shemaim from Yah, having the glory of Yah. Her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels mm. at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of Bani Yisrael. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So all praise is glory and honor be unto Yah, the Holy One of Israel, who thinks it not to love his people and prepare for us in the days ahead his glorious kingdom that is to come. 
For this kingdom shall not be left to other people, for it shall break and destroy and break all other kingdoms in pieces and pound them into dust. Behold, there was a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hand, and it was hurled at the image of the beast. And when it struck the image of the beast, that it itself became a huge mountain. And as the scripture says, and it filled the whole earth. And so we are awaiting the glorious coming of HaMashiach and the forthcoming of his glorious kingdom that will descend unto us from on high where we, his people, will dwell in his midst, where it will no longer be a scripture that we quote, but actually a phrase that we will utter in the reality that we will experience that will say, Behold, the tabernacle of Yah is among men, and we will be his people, and Yah will be our heir. And so I look forward to those days that are coming, and I look forward and pray that you receive that which has been shared and taught with you, that we will not remain in the lands of captivity much longer, that Yah will set forth his hand a second time and regather his people from a worldwide dispersion. For he who scattered Israel will regather Israel and keep them as the shepherd keeps his fold. So now let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, that we, Israel, shall fear Yah and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. May Yahweh bless you, Israel. May Yahweh keep you, Israel. May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you. May Yahweh lift up the countenance upon you. And may Yahweh be gracious unto you and give you eternal and everlasting peace. May Yah bless you. Shabbat shalom. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
of y'all the most high are still online i hope and pray that you uh were spiritually fed and edified with the lesson so the revival hey, hallelujah. Hey. hallelujah and i wanted to take just a little time you know we meant to do this at the beginning of the shabbat seder but you know uh i take full responsibility for that i was remiss because i get so focused into what the lesson and the message is for you all uh that it did not come immediately to my mind uh, the subject matter of sacred visitation. So prayerfully, those who are uh, on the line can take down the information that I'm about to share with you, and then subsequently you can contact me or Ima Zamiria later on uh, after the Shabbat. If not tonight, tomorrow, Mahra, um, so that we can give you some updated information. And also, if you listen to the lesson later on today, or perhaps if you go online and listen to uh, the class that was on Yom Kamashi, we were able to share some information with you then. And so each lesson, regular Hebrew Biblical Fundamentals class, and then the subsequent Shabbat, we will continue to disseminate to you more information to keep you abreast of what is going on. So this is what's happening. Y'all willing, we are taking a sacred visitation home to the Promised Land in 2017. We will be traveling up to Israel in the months. So I'll use these months for a place of reference. And the Hebrew months will be attached in the flyer and the brochure. 
where we'll be traveling up in the months of May and the months of June 2017. Approximately the 17th of May 2017 through uh, the 4th or 7th of June. Your airfare is the very first thing that we are going to secure. For all intense respect of the Shabbat, I don't discuss business matters on it. What you simply need to know is your deposit amount is $300. We'll get into the details of how much the Sacred Visitation Tour will cost, what's all involved. We will be in the Holy Land from a period of 14 to 17 days, visiting at least 14 sacred sites. We will travel up to Yerushalayim, both places. We will go to both Mount Zion. We will be staying in the south, uh, as our father Abraham did when he first entered the land. And you can traverse through the sacred sites that we will be uh, visiting. All right? So please set aside some time to discuss this matter at a later time. Uh, we will be in contact, and we pray that we will also be in contact and communication with us as well. What you need to write down now is the email address, right? And I don't know if Ima Zamiria has returned. She was online. She stepped away for a minute. She's taking care of an assignment. Um, Here. But, uh, could you be so kind to uh, share with the saints the email address that you want them to contact you at, and then please make sure she gets what she needs from you because this will help us in the process. Go right ahead, Ima. Uh, the email address is Kaziel7, that's K-H-A-Z-Y-E-L, the number 7, at yahoo.com. Please make sure you uh, email me because this will be the only way for me to send you the information. All right. Now, that's the only way, and that's the initial way that we're going to communicate with one another because it's orderly. It gives us a, a, a receipt of our communication with one another, not just financially speaking, but the times we communicate to you and the times you communicate to us, and we do this in decency and orderly. So we need that for a, a way for us to communicate with one another so we can expedite uh, things and do it in an orderly and timely fashion. Um, after the upcoming week's uh, lesson, which will be on Yom Kamashi, more information will be disseminated. So you should begin to look for a flyer and a, a pamphlet explaining things a little bit more in detail. And that should be forthcoming within the next few days. Like I said, you should have it next uh, week, preferably. If you have any questions, send them to the email address she gave you. Uh, and we look forward to communicating with each and every one of you. And we look forward, indeed, to seeing each and every one of you in the land of our fathers in 2017. All right, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. Enjoy the rest of the Shabbat. And I look forward to communicating with you all really soon. Hallelujah. Yakai, shalom. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom.